Bienvenidos un año más a la 34 edición del Simposium Internacional de Patología Intersticial Pulmonar, que se celebra hoy en Barcelona, en el Hospital Universitario Vallebrón, en la que es eh, su primera edición o versión virtual, eh, lógicamente en contexto de la pandemia de la COVID-19, pero lo que nos ha permitido paralelamente pues, llegar a, a muchos más de vosotros. Eh, en nombre del comité organizador queremos dar las gracias en primer lugar a los inscritos. Este año tenemos cerca de 375 inscritos, no solo de España, pero también de Portugal, Francia, Perú, Colombia y Argentina. Queremos eh, daros las gracias por vuestra confianza un año más y por vuestro apoyo y, y confiar, como decíamos, en nosotros y en los contenidos que vamos a ofrecer. En segundo lugar, nos gustaría agradecer o dar las gracias a los sponsors, a AstraZeneca, Beringer, eh, Kiesi, GSK y Roche. Sin duda alguna, sin vuestra ayuda, esto sería muchísimo más complicado. Y en tercer lugar, nos gustaría extender eh, nuestro agradecimiento, un agradecimiento muy cálido a nuestros ponentes, que son los que le dan músculo y calidad a, a los contenidos de, de este curso. Eh, me acompañan en esta moderación eh, el doctor Morey, eh, fundador del curso y codirector del Simposium de Patología Intersticial, el doctor Ferrer, jefe de servicio y codirector, y en breve se estará con nosotros también la doctora Villar, neumóloga y codirectora de, de este curso. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the annual International uh, Interstitial Lung Disease Symposium that takes place here in Barcelona, in the Valdebron University Hospital. And we are happy to announce that we have nearly almost 400 uh, people attending the course. Not only uh, chest physicians, but also uh, GPs, rheumatologists and radiologists uh, from all over the world. We would like to thank uh, uh, all the people that are attending the course. Thank you very much for your trust. The sponsors, AstraZeneca, Beringer, Kiesi, GSK and Roche. And of course, we would like to extend our gratitude to the lecturers for uh, sharing with, our, with us generously their expertise. So I would like to extend our gratitude. Uh, queremos extender también nuestro agradecimiento a nuestra secretaria Rosa Lloria, que es el motor de, de este curso, la que eh, sin su ayuda no podríamos llevar a cabo este, este evento en el que ponemos tanto cariño. Uh, we would like to extend our gratitude to Rosa Lloria, our secretary, uh, who is in charge of practically everything. Sin más dilación, le doy la palabra a nuestro jefe de servicio y codirector del curso, al doctor Ferrer. Gracias, doctor Honguren. Uh, en nombre de, de todo el servicio de neumología del Hospital Vallebrón, uh, me es muy grato inaugurar uh, este 34 Uh, symposium sobre enfermedades intestinales pulmonares uh, en esta situación tan especial y en este nuevo formato. Les doy la bienvenida y espero que el simposium responda a las expectativas uh, que esperamos por la calidad de los ponentes y también la participación activa de los profesionales uh, inscritos. On behalf of the respiratory department of the Hospital by Debron, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to inaugurate the 34th International Symposium on Interstitial Lung Diseases. I'm sure the symposium uh, will be very successful, taking into account the high quality of the, of the speakers and the attendance active participation. So, uh, welcome to the symposium and uh, we can start now the, the first session. Muchas gracias, Jauma. Uh, sin más dilación, daremos comienzo al primer bloque, a la primera sesión donde trataremos temas de actualidad eh, de gran relevancia para todos los que estamos interesados en las enfermedades intersticiales pulmonares difusas. El primer bloque consta de cinco ponencias, eh, de 20 minutos cada una. Eh, después de las dos primeras ponencias, que serán en inglés, podremos realizar las preguntas durante cinco minutos a cada una de las ponentes y después de las tres ponencias en castellano que vienen a continuación, haremos una pequeña discusión de eh, diez minutos. Por tanto, doy paso a la primera ponente, que es la doctora Margaret Salisbury, que trabaja en el Vanderbilt University Medical Center en Nashville, Tennessee, Estados Unidos. Eh, 
Ella es neumóloga y eh, dedica su actividad clínica e investigadora a las enfermedades intersticiales pulmonares difusas. Ella ha, ha estado, está involucrada en múltiples trabajos y ha estado involucrada en eh, múltiples artículos que se han publicado en las mejores revistas científicas. Eh, la conocéis perfectamente. Eh, Dr. Margaret Salisbury, uh, welcome. Uh, you are worldwide well known in context of your work in the area of interstitial lung disease. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure and an honor uh, for us you to join our international symposium. And uh, well, she will talk to us about the uh, non IPF progressive fibrosis, fibrosing interstitial pneumonia, diagnostic criteria and treatment. So, Margaret, uh, please, whenever you are ready, uh, you can go ahead. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. I'm going to get my screen shared. Um, I'm happy to be with you as well. Maybe next time we'll be together in Barcelona. Um, I'm going to speak about the diagnosis and management of non-idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or progressive pulmonary fibrosis. Um, I have a few disclosures, including consulting fees from some pharma companies. And the agenda for this rather short talk on a broad topic is that we will define some specific phenotypes and subtypes and discuss management considerations throughout um, with each of these phenotypes. So pulmonary fibrosis classification or diffuse parenchymal lung disease um, is classified currently as either idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial pneumonia or uh, parenchymal lung disease of known cause. So the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias include um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, as well as a variety of other um, less common subtypes, including <clears throat> NSIP, organizing pneumonia, LIP, um, and then diffuse parenchymal lung disease of known cause primarily includes connective tissue diseases, pneumoconioses, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, drug toxicity, um, and there are a handful of other somewhat less common parenchymal lung diseases. And I think the The overarching theme of diffuse parenchymal lung disease is that essentially any um, subtype has the capacity to cause pulmonary fibrosis that can progress over time. Um, so es essentially any of the, the non-IPF subtypes can take on kind of a progressive fibrosing phenotype similar to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and I will also point out that um, a number of the idiopathic subtypes Um, including UIP, IPF, um, and also NSIP, and several of the others are rather common, particularly in the connective tissue disease um, category, as well as um, can, can sometimes be seen in similar fashion in hypersensitivity and pneumonitis. Um, the estimated distribution of pulmonary fibrosis subtypes is approximately 20% each idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis chronic hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, connective tissue disease, and then sarcoidosis. And then a bit less common are pneumoconioses and other interstitial lung diseases. So just defining some uh, fibrosis findings, um, it's, it's important to be able to identify pulmonary fibrosis. And our best and least invasive tool um, is high-resolution CT, or HRCT for short. Um, so there are three cardinal um, findings that one can see to, together or individually in pulmonary fibrosis. So first is honeycombing, um, which is in the red boxes on this CT slice, and it's defined by clustered cystic air spaces of consistent diameter um, with thick, well-defined walls. And then reticulation is shown in the little black box and around the, the crosshairs, and it's defined by innumerable small linear opacities that resemble a net. And then finally, traction bronchiectasis is um, defined by irregular bronchial uh, dilation. Importantly, that's caused by surrounding retractile pulmonary fibrosis, so the airway is essentially pulled open um, by the, the distorting fibrosis around it. And those are the red arrows there. And we currently classify 
um, pulmonary fibrosis using a scheme that was uh, developed in, in the 2000s and updated in 2018. Um, we call uh, a, a pattern of fibrosis a UIP or usual interstitial pneumonia pattern. Um, so UIP or probable UIP when we see uh, fibrosis that is uh, subplural and most predominant in the lung bases um, and can, can sometimes have a rather heterogeneous distribution throughout the lungs. Um, to call something definite UIP or just UIP, um, one would be looking for honeycomb cysts, whereas probable UIP has all the same features but without honeycombing. Um, the indeterminate category is for rather more mild disease or perhaps not fitting neatly into either the, the UIP patterns or the alternative diagnosis patterns. Um, <clears throat> and then alternative diagnosis, the, the list of findings that would put uh, a CT scan in this category was expanded quite a bit in 2018, um, but by and large they are features that would suggest a different type of pulmonary fibrosis, such as discrete cysts might suggest LIP, um, pleural plaques might suggest asbestosis, um, things like dilated esophagus, autoimmune disease, or clavicular erosions can be seen in rheumatoid arthritis. So just other specific features that might point one away from usual interstitial pneumonia. Um, and the, the radiologic classification scheme is really a surrogate for biopsy-proved usual interstitial pneumonia, um, which in the correct clinical setting would be expected in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So when one sees the UIP pattern on a CT scan, about 90% or more of those individuals have biopsy-proved UIP, um, whereas the probable category without honeycombing, about 70% of those have biopsy-proved UIP. And classification of pulmonary fibrosis should correspond with treatment, um, although this this is likely to, to shift a little bit and probably has over the last couple of years. Um, we typically consider um, immunosuppression for many of the um, parenchymal lung diseases of known cause, um, whereas for the, the past five plus years, um, antifibrotic drugs have been more the norm just in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, um, where we also tend to avoid immunosuppression. So I'm gonna first talk about um, connective tissue disease associated interstitial lung disease, um, and specifically review expected patterns of pulmonary fibrosis in different autoimmune diseases. So this um, graph plots the proportion of each of uh, five different connective tissue diseases, um, the proportion of patients that have NSIP, which is the, the white portion of the bar, uh, UIP, or other ILD subtypes. So we can see that the, the scleroderma and myositis have um, a high proportion with NSIP-like um, interstitial lung disease and a smaller proportion with UIP and other. Um, Sjogren's has a lot of other because we see a lot of airway disease and LIP, um, but about half have NSIP. Um, undifferentiated connective tissue apparently is mostly um, NSIP pattern, um, whereas rheumatoid arthritis has a much higher proportion of patients presenting with um, UIP pattern, um, and this is based on lung biopsy findings. So treatment of uh, connective tissue disease Unfortunately, there are only um, clinical trial data uh, testing treatment specifically for the interstitial lung disease piece of autoimmune disease um, in systemic sclerosis. So that's what I'll, I'll focus on. Um, and what we know about systemic sclerosis, ILD, is largely extrapolated to management of other forms of connective tissue disease, ILD. Um, so there were a couple of landmark studies, the scleroderma lung studies one and two, um, that uh, suggested a, a benefit of immunosuppression to the interstitial lung disease. So scleroderma one tested oral cyclophosphamide or placebo for 12 months. Um, the inclusion criteria are here. Um, importantly, the, the subjects had to have active alveolitis either on a BAL or ground glass on a CT scan. 
Um, and then they, they limited inclusion of subjects with pulmonary hypertension and also limited um, current or prior treatments with some immunosuppressants. And this is the graph of the primary outcome, which was uh, changed from baseline in the force vital capacity. So the cyclophosphamide treated patients, um, approximately half of them experienced improvement in their force vital capacity um, compared to only 20, 26% in the placebo treated group. Um, there, there were a fair number more um, adverse events and serious adverse events in the treated group, um, but, but nonetheless, the treated group experience improvement in force vital capacity, also shortness of breath and other quality of life measures. So clearly there's a benefit of immunosuppression to um, systemic sclerosis ILD, which again tends to be NSIP pattern. And then the scler scleroderma lung study two um, was a trial of oral cyclophosphamide for 12 months followed by placebo compared to mycophenolate um, orally for 24 months. The criteria were similar um, compared to scleroderma 1, and this study, while helpful, is considered a little bit harder to interpret. Um, it was powered to detect um, a difference, or it, in other words, it was a superiority trial, um, and they found no difference in the treatments, um, but mycophenolate was a bit more tolerable in terms of ability to titrate the drug um, and also in terms of bone marrow um, suppression effects that are quite common with cyclophosphamide. Um, but again here, um, upwards of 60% of subjects in each group experienced improvement in the, the force vital capacity um, during the study period. And um, one of the main issues with interpretation here is that there was a lot of cyclophosphamide to mycophenolate crossover, which may have obscured any um, detection of superiority of the mycophenolate, but due to tolerability issues, mycophenolate has essentially become kind of the standard of care for scleroderma ILD. And then finally, um, with connective tissue disease specifically, um, there was a more recent trial, the census trial, that tested oral nintendinib or placebo for 12 months um, in systemic sclerosis ILD. Um, I'll point out a few uh, inclusion criteria of interest. Um, so they, they did not require documented progression prior to enrollment in this trial, but they did require that a high-res CT showed greater than 10% fibrosis. Um, and this trial did allow use of other um, background immunosuppression therapies, including mycophenolate or methotrexate, um, provided that they were at stable doses. Um, and this trial documented a modest but statistically significant difference in the annual rate of change in force vital capacity. So the, the treated patients on Nintendinib had about a 41% milliliter per year preservation in force vital capacity um, compared to placebo who had a bigger decline over one year. Um, and the, the main side effects of uh, Nintendinib are diarrhea, which was reported in 76% of the treated versus 32% of the untreated, um, and a, a bit more treated patients had to stop treatment during the study period because of um, side effects and other issues. So I'm going to move on to other forms of progressive fibrosing ILD um, from, from connective tissue disease and point out the importance of recognizing fibrosis. So this is some data from hypersensitivity pneumonitis. The, the plot is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve um, with hypersensitivity pneumonitis subjects stratified based on whether they had any fibrosis on a lung biopsy, and that was defined by 5% um, or more collagen deposition. So 5% isn't a lot. Um, so even minimal fibrosis um, portends a poor outcome in hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So the, the non-fibrotic subjects survived on average more than 20 years, whereas fibrotic HP has an average survival of about seven years. <clears throat> and um, I, I wanted to speak specifically about the importance of recognizing UIP-like fibrosis and hypersensitivity pneumonitis, so often defined primarily by honeycombing as well as the, the distribution on a CT or, or the biopsy features. This 
this graph is based on um, biopsy proved uh, interstitial lung disease and it plots survival for bird exposed individuals who had UIP on a biopsy um, compared to UIP IPF, those without bird exposure, and they had kind of an overlapping poor survival time um, compared to people with chronic pigeon breeder's lung or biopsy-proved hypersensitivity and pneumonitis has a much better outcome. Um, and this is data that we generated um, when I was at Michigan, and we, we looked at the CT features um, of hypersensitivity and pneumonitis as well as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and plotted subjects when they were stratified by diagnosis, so HP versus IPF, as well as stratified by the CT phenotype. Um, so we, we classified patients as having honeycomb fibrosis if they had any honeycombing on the CT scan. Um, Non-honeycomb fibrosis is, is here in the middle, and that was when a person had any traction bronchiectasis and reticulation on the CT scan. And then non-fibrotic um, did not have either of those features. Um, and we can see that there's a distinct survival time for each of these groups. So the, the no fibrosis does the best. Um, Non-honeycomb fibrosis does a little bit worse, but honeycombing fibrosis by far is the, the worst survival time although that was in a rather small group of patients. Um, only about 8% of HP in this cohort had honeycomb fibrosis. And we see um, also in this, the same study, the same groups um, stratified, as I just mentioned, um, the, the non-honeycomb fibrosis HP as well as the honeycomb fibrosis HP experience a decline in the, the force vital capacity during the year after the CT scan whereas those with non-fibrotic HP actually have a significant improvement in the force vital capacity. Um, so fibrosis is likely to progress, whereas non-fibrotic HP has the capacity to improve, actually. And then a little bit more data from other diseases that having UIP-like fibrosis is bad. Um, so this is rheumatoid arthritis, where rheumatoid with um, non-UIP CT patterns do a lot better compared to rheumatoid arthritis with UIP, which has a very similar survival time to IPF. Um, this is biopsy proved um, RA UIP IPF here, and then um, NSIP, connective tissue disease, has the, the best survival time. And then here in IPATH, um, where IPATH is defined by certain features that could suggest um, connective tissue disease, such as Raynaud phenomenon and or antibodies in the blood, um, but not meeting criteria for a specific connective tissue disease syndrome. So the, the red line here is IPATH with usual interstitial pneumonia on a CT scan, and again, overlapping survival with um, IPF uh, without antibodies. Um, and then IPATH without UIP pattern as well as connective tissue disease, um, have a, a lot better survival time. So getting into pharmacotherapy or treatment of progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease, um, I'd like to start here actually with some clinical trial data on idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So the PANTHER trial um, was a 60-week trial of combined prednisone and azathioprine, so kind of um, non-specific immunosuppression um, to treat idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And um, I'd particularly like to point out some, some kind of gray areas in the inclusion criteria. So um, the PANTHER trial excluded patients that had UIP due to a clinically significant environmental exposure or if they had a diagnosis of connective tissue disease. Um, and I, I tend to think of this as a trial of treatment for UIP um, because there's a lot of variability in, in what clinicians would consider as clinically significant. Um, and there's also a, a rather high rate of uh, connective tissue disease presenting primarily with lung disease. And then either the autoimmune condition is never diagnosed or is diagnosed later. So I, I think there could be a lot of um, overlap in terms of what some people could call hypersensitivity pneumonitis or autoimmune disease that may have made it into this trial um, because they had CT or biopsy proved UIP and, and were classified as IPF. Um, and this study 
was actually stopped early um, because the patients on combination immunosuppression experienced a significantly greater rate of death from any cause, hospitalizations, acute ILD exacerbations, and serious adverse events. So this trial was halted because of um, a risk for harm on the active treatment. So immunosuppression is certainly bad for um, individuals with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and that may be extrapolated in some situations to those with other forms of usual interstitial pneumonia like ILD. Um, so other data on pharmacotherapy for idiopathic, or I'm sorry, non-idiopathic progressive fibrosis. Um, so a couple of years ago now, um, the InBuild trial was um, finalized and published. This was a 52-week study of nintenanib in non-idiopathic progressive fibrosing interstitial lung diseases. Um, I'd point out a few key inclusion criteria. Um, to be in this study, a subject had to have documented progression of their ILD in the prior 24 months, and that was defined either by um, pulmonary function criteria or by worsening respiratory symptoms or increasing extent um, of disease on high-res CT or a combination thereof. Um, and this study, unlike the census trial in scleroderma, actually excluded subjects who were on any background um, immunosuppression. So they, they, they were not on background treatment um, for their, their primary ILD. And this study did document um, a, a better um, forced vital capacity trajectory in the intended treated patients. Um, so on average, over the, the 52-week period, um, the nintenanib preserved about 100 milliliters of lung function. Um, and that was true whether patients had UIP-like fibrosis or um, the overall population who may or may not have UIP-like findings on their, their CT or biopsy. And this is the adverse events in this trial. It's very similar to the IPF trials. So the primary side effect um, is diarrhea in about two-thirds of nintenanib versus only about 25% of placebo patients. Um, and then a variety of other adverse events were, were reported, um, including mostly GI side effects that were different between groups. So some vomiting, as well as um, occasionally observed elevation in um, liver enzymes. And then pharmacotherapy for PFILD, perfenidone has also been evaluated in a phase two 24 week trial of progressive, um, unclassifiable pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and this, this trial enrolled kind of a similar cohort, although they were considered unclassifiable or low confidence diagnoses. Um, they also had to demonstrate progression. Um, unfortunately, the, the primary endpoint was um, home measured barometry for spinal capacity, and there were some some quality control issues where, whereby the primary endpoint was not um, interpretable. However, one of the secondary endpoints was the lab measured for spinal capacity, and the, the perfenidone treated patients, um, again, had about a almost 100 milliliter um, preservation in their forced vital capacity, um, and that was statistically significant, but it was not the primary endpoint in this trial. So to wrap up here, um, I hope I've convinced you that identifying connected tissue disease is of rather high importance um, because a lot of these patients, while they, they can develop progressive fibrosis, many of them have um, NSIP-like pathology and have the capacity to improve with immunosuppression. And we now also know that um, in subjects with established fibrosis or patients with established fibrosis, I should say, um, antifibrotics can be helpful. So I, I do a rather broad panel of testing and often, um, if I have any suspicion, have patients see a rheumatologist um, just because it's so important to identify connective tissue disease. Um, the next point, I hope I've convinced you that identifying U, UIP-like fibrosis defined by, by biopsy features or by honeycombing on CT scan is important um, and that immunosuppression may, may be harmful in this group. Um, I tend to avoid it when I can, unless it's directed at treating 
for example, joint disease and rheumatoid arthritis, obviously you have to control that. But I, I often stay away from Im immunosuppression when it's just directed at UIP like ILD. Um, and I really think at this point, antifibrotics are considered first line. And when, when there's a UIP like um, pattern, I don't feel the need to observe progression um, in these patients. Um, I often will just start, start these as first line. And I think there are some ongoing gray areas that are worth mentioning. First of all, um, you know, non-UIP non connective to non-connective tissue disease, that is fibrosis. Um, you know, we, we have some data from the inbuilt trial that um, antifibrotics are helpful. Um, however, they, that trial had pretty strict criteria about whether a patient progressed or not. And I think we, we still struggle with whether we need to kind of observe progression before starting antifibrotics. Um, and then another key question is whether off-label immunosuppression is helpful um, in this group. You know, it's, it's never been specifically tested, particularly in hypersensitivity pneumonitis or in, in connective tissue disease that is not scleroderma. Um, I often consider it. Um, but but I, I I use it quite with caution, um, just based on the the Panther trial when there's clear cut fibrosis. But I think that's a, a real gray area. And with that, I will end, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Margaret, uh, Dr. Salisbury, thank you very much for your nice presentation. So now we will uh, spend some minutes uh, with some comments or questions regarding your presentation. Le recuerdo a la audiencia que tiene la posibilidad de plantear sus preguntas en el, en el chat. Así que, por favor, no, no seáis tímidos. Eh, lanzar las preguntas que, que queráis oportunas. ¿Se me está escuchando? Vale. Como os decía, eh, le recuerdo a la audiencia que pueden eh, plantear sus preguntas en el chat. Y, mientras tanto, mientras la gente va formulando las preguntas, eh, pues aquí desde la, desde la mesa de la moderación, eh, plantearemos alguna, alguna que otra. Eh, Margaret, eh, we have some questions for you regarding your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, it was super interesting. And, um, well, uh, in patients with non-IPF progressive fibrosis interstitial pneumonia that are already on oral steroids or other immunosuppression, and uh, you start on uh, off-label antifibrotics, how do you handle the immunosuppression? I mean, do you keep the same treatment? Would you uh, try to step down? Would you re even remove the immunosuppression since it mean, it seems that it's not working? Uh, which is your experience with, with this topic? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think there's, there's no great answer on what to do with the immunosuppression. Um, you know, I, I keep a high um, degree of suspicion and eye out for complications. You know, if, if the patient has experienced a lot of infections um, or if they, if they have any history of malignancy, um, I might be a little bit more inclined to move away from the immunosuppression, particularly if there was not a documented improvement in their, their lung function or their symptoms when they started it. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's pretty clear that, um, you know, whether, whether they're treated with immunosuppression or not, there's a, a good chance that they'll get worse over time when there's any kind of fibrosis, um, which makes it really hard to interpret any benefit of immunosuppression in a particular patient. Um, and, and we don't really have those trials to show whether, whether it's preserving any more decline in, in forced vital capacity, for example. Um, I, I often, when there's not UIP like fibrosis, I, I tend to keep them on it with, with the, the antifibrotics. Um, you know, from the, the scleroderma trial, it, it should be well enough tolerated. Um, but that's a, a big gray area and an and a outstanding question that we need to answer with more research. <laughs> no, that was clear enough. Thank you very much. Uh, Margaret, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I enjoyed very much your your your, your talk. I have Great, a, just just a comment. Uh, 
uh, I think, in, in my opinion, we haven't progressed very much in treatment of this of, of this disease. No, uh, unfortunately. I agree. Yes, uh, but but I, I see that uh, we we improve it. Our 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 mod, our classification. No, that is, for example, you present that the IPF now is about 20% of 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 ILD uh, diseases, and uh, from 20 years ago. We, we 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 classified IPF as 30 at, at least 30 percent, 30 percent, 40 percent, I'm sorry, 40 percent. So we, we we learn to classify, and I think it's it's it's, it's important to apply uh, uh, the treatment that that is, is more convenient for every 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 disease. Uh, do do you, do you think that IPF? Uh, if if we are improving, improving our diagnosis will disappear. <laughs> if we're improving our classification, will other ILDs appear? Is that the question? Yes, yes. If yeah. I, I, I mean, I I think there's kind of a risk of over over classifying or over splitting um, in some ways. I I do worry a little bit that um, when we're splitting off different subgroups of UIP. Um, you know, we we risk forgetting about studies like the Panther trial that that show good evidence on how to treat it, for example. Um, but I certainly think having more awareness about identifying potentially treatable um, non UIP like diseases, particularly hypersensitivity pneumonitis and and autoimmune diseases, I think is of high importance because those those patients oftentimes likely would be best treated with, with a different strategy than just antifibrotics. Thank you very much, Margaret. We have one question from the audience. It will be the last question since we are uh, uh, nearly after time. But uh, Dr. Uh, Jacobo Sayares from Barcelona is asking if instead of choosing antifibrotics or immunosuppression, couldn't we uh, simply uh, start a combination of both treatments in some cases instead of Using one or, one or another? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. I, I think the data in scleroderma shows that we certainly don't have to choose. So the antifibrotics were essentially, in many cases, an add on to, to background immunosuppression. And although the inbuilt trial um, did not have progressive fibrosis on background immunosuppression, um, as we, we spoke a little bit about, I often you know, I, I have a handful of patients that are on both, so I, I don't necessarily think that we always need to choose. Um, I, I think the, the data, especially in scleroderma um, trial, suggests that both could be well tolerated and, and both might be appropriate depending on the patient. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your answer, Margaret, and thank you very much again for joining us. It was a great pleasure. Uh, we, you, we wish you to have a good day. It's uh, uh, in the morning right now. You are in your ward, so have a good day and thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye. Así pues, eh, pasaremos a nuestra siguiente ponencia, que será a cargo de la doctora Kerry Johansson, del Department, del Department of Medicine eh, de la Universidad de Calgary, en Alberta, en Canadá. Ella es eh, neumóloga, dedica su actividad clínica investigadora a las enfermedades intersticiales pulmonares. Ella es ampliamente conocida en los diferentes foros internacionales de PID y bueno, ha participado en múltiples trabajos de gran impacto en relación, pues, entre otros, a la neumonitis por hipersensibilidad crónica. Good morning, uh, Kerry. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, you had to wake up very early. We really appreciate your effort. And while well, we just well explain in the audience that they already know that you are uh, internationally well known uh, due to your expertise in ILD, and well, she will talk us about the relevance of finding the etiology in hypersensitivity in pneumonitis comments on the guidelines on exposure. So whenever you are ready, uh, Curry, please go ahead. We are all listening to you. Thanks. Oh, hang on. Just you can go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, here we go. Okay, how's that? You can see my presentation okay? 
Yes, yes. Yes, please. Good, well, good morning. Well, good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this is exciting to, to speak to you all today about hypersensitivity pneumonitis and the importance of exposure identification and identifying the antigen. It's intimidating to speak to this audience, particularly the moderators who have published and have many years of experience in this field. So I hope I can do the topic justice. So these are my disclosures. I think mostly unrelated to the um, to the topic today, uh, and I hope that at the end of this, um, you know, we'll all understand the importance of identifying the antigen and hypersensitivity pneumonitis. I'm going to focus on the the guideline recommendations, so the new uh, HP guideline that was published um, with the American Thoracic Society, the Japanese Respiratory Society, and ALAT from uh, Latin America, um, just to interpret some of the recommendations and then understand what tools are sort of broadly available uh, to identify antigens in HP. So we now have a definition of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and Professor uh, Morell will be going through the guideline in more detail, but this is an important starting point. So HP is an inflammatory and or fibrotic disease affecting the lung parenchyma and small airways. The important thing here is that it results from an immune-mediated reaction provoked by an occult or overt inhaled antigen in susceptible individuals. So this is the consensus diagnosis from the guideline, and it includes the definition of an inhaled antigen triggering the immune uh, reaction. And we know that antigen identification is important, so it's a key component of establishing a diagnosis. Uh, not having an antigen identified is an independent risk factor for poor outcomes in our patients, and that was first shown here uh, by Evans Fernandez Perez uh, with this um, graph here. So these are patients who had an identifiable antigen, and this is survival of those who did not. Um, there was greater risk of death without identifying one. And what's interesting, it's been reported that 50% of patients with chronic HP at ILD referral centers have no antigen identified. So how much that applies broadly to HP, I think, is variable. Um, so we, this is uh, unpublished data, actually recently rejected data, which we're hoping to have published at some point soon. But this is a, a review of the published literature. So antigen indeterminate HP, you know, it's often quoted that in fibrotic disease, it's 50% of cases. Uh, we have found here that it's about, in prospective registries, makes up 18 to 32% of, of uh, cohorts of patients. And in retrospective studies is about 10 to 32 percent. So overall in HP, it's probably a little bit less. Those published studies are from uh, tertiary referral centers, um, predominantly in the U.S. And I think we have um, more work to do to understand antigen indeterminate when you don't find a problem or find the cause. We also think that um, the type of antigen is associated, or sorry, whether you identify an antigen or do not identify an antigen may be associated with the phenotype of disease. So in this very small, there was only four studies that we could pool here, but not having an identified antigen was associated with a higher likelihood of having fibrosis in HP. And as Dr. Salisbury showed, fibrosis in HP is associated with worse outcomes. The chronic HP Delphi survey uh, by Julie Marset in 2018 um, ranked, this, this was a first attempt at trying to find a consensus diagnosis for HP. Um, and using expertise from around the world, these were thought to be the most important features of establishing a diagnosis of chronic HP. And three out of the top five involve the antigen. So having a history of environmental exposure known to cause HP, having a time relation with the disease, so you were exposed and then developed disease, and then getting better with antigen avoidance. The other was a radiographic and a pathologic feature. So based on their study, uh, on this Delphi study, they established this sort of clinical algorithm for uh, establishing a diagnosis of HP and how confident you can be. And what I want to draw your attention to here is that it all starts with the exposure. This was the most important um, feature. So if you have an identified exposure, let's say they have a whole bunch of birds, look at the CT scan. If they have these combinations of findings on HRCT of the chest, you can establish a pretty high confident diagnosis of HP of greater than 70%. You want to make that higher, consider a BAL. If there's a lymphocytosis, you can establish a confident diagnosis. So even if you don't have a classic CT scan, but you have a positive exposure, but you get a lung biopsy, this can lead to a confident diagnosis. If you do not identify an exposure, no matter 
what you do, it's hard to establish a confident diagnosis. So here, no exposure identified. The CT is classic, they have lymphocytosis. Really, based on the Delphi, this was thought to have a diagnostic confidence. The best you could do is 50%. It's not, not uh, very satisfying. Um, if you do a lung biopsy in these cases, possibly a confidence of greater than 70%, but again, you cannot establish a confident diagnosis of HP in the absence of an exposure based on this study. So there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of need in the field of HP, and um, this uh, guideline was just published, and it was my first guideline to be a part of, along with Professor Morell and, and uh, Dr. Salisbury. So it was a really exciting opportunity to learn about guidelines, and I think um, so. I'm going to go through just the exposure assessment uh, parts of this, which were two of the PICO questions that were addressed in the guideline. But I think it's really important to always um, mention that clinicians should apply the recommendations within any clinical practice guideline in the context of each individual patient, considering the patient's values and preferences, and should not consider any recommendation as a mandate. So no guideline or recommendation can consider all potential clinical circumstances. And I think that's really important. And I'll talk a little bit about this, but not everywhere has the capacity to do all of the tests, um, or it may not be desirable to do all the things in the guideline. Uh, for your particular patient. And so these are, you know, this is an overview of the literature, um, but you know, these are not mandates and need to be interpreted in your expertise and uh, with the patient. So this is the sort of crowning glory of the guideline. Uh, it's a uh, very sort of busy algorithm with lots of, uh, lots of colors and boxes and different potential combinations. Um, and I'm going to go through this with some examples, but but what I want to highlight here is there's the two most important things that is the starting point is the CT scan pattern and then a history of exposure or not. And then everything that we do after determines um, the confidence or the likelihood of a diagnosis. So I'll go through this with some examples after. So I first just wanted to, to highlight the two PICO questions um, in the guideline that address exposure assessment. So the first one is, should patients with new ILD where hypersensitivity pneumonitis is suspected undergo formal questioning with a questionnaire? So really, this was done, I mean, these are done um, with uh, academic librarians and extensive systematic literature search, and really this identified two observational studies to address this question. They're both considered very low quality evidence um, as retrospective studies, not prospective, not randomized. And at the end, there's no questionnaire that's been validated for use in HP. What did come out of the data is that questionnaires will perform better than taking a history to identify potential HP exposures. And that makes sense. I think a questionnaire will often be a long checklist. It's standardized. You can't forget anything in this sort of the few or small amount of data that looked at this, it identified an exposure 100% of the time. So essentially, if you ask enough questions, you will find an exposure that causes HP. And I would argue that that's probably true of many ILD patients and not just HP, whereas the history only identifies it about 26% of the time. Uh, because if we just use a history, we have to remember everything. And it's almost impossible in the clinic uh, to, you know, to remember to ask about, do they play a trombone or do they work with compost? You know, we can remember the common things, but not everything. So questionnaires perform better. However, what they found was that only 70% of potential exposures identified by a questionnaire were confirmed by environmental sampling. So you will find that they, yes, they report that they have mold exposure, but if you actually go and sample their environment, uh, we may be overcalling that exposure and it may be too broadly uh, sensitive and not specific. So the recommendation in the uh, guideline is that for both non-fibrotic and fibrotic HP, there was no recommendation for or against the use of a specific questionnaire to identify potential inciting agents of HP. But the recommendation was to please somebody develop a questionnaire um, and to take a thorough history. And I know there there is certainly work ongoing. So this um, this was published in ERJ Open last year, and this was a very evidence based uh, review of the published literature um, by Petnak and Mua, um, where then they proposed this potential questionnaire. So um, trying to highlight all of the relevant uh, or the most common exposures that could be associated with HP, that this might be a helpful starting point. Again, this hasn't been validated, but was proposed based on um, evidence. <clears throat> 
so Haley Barnes also uh, published a study last year in CHEST um, looking, it was a Delphi study of ex 36 experts from around the world, which I'm sure included some experts from from Spain and found that 18 items reached consensus as being important exposures to ask about and to include on a questionnaire for chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And she developed a proposed questionnaire and this is in the, the supplement. And again, this remains to be validated, um, which I think is probably the next step. Importantly, I'm not sure that any one single questionnaire can be broadly applied to every part of the world. Um, you know, I live in a very dry environment uh, here in Alberta. Uh, there's not a lot of mold. Um, you know, other parts of the world are very moldy or have a lot of, you know, culturally may have a lot of birds in the home. Um, so it might be very different uh, place to place. And I think that's important to remember as we develop these moving forward. So we developed this website a couple of years ago. Um, it's I was inspired by uh, Pneumotox and I wanted to make a website that was basically the Pneumotox for HP. So we did a very similar thing to the, the prior study that I showed where we, we reviewed all the literature on published uh, cases of HP. And so you can go to hplung.com um, and look to see if anybody has ever reported HP because of air conditioners. There are 48 cases. If you click on this link, it will take you to the listing of the citations and then you can review those to see if, um, if you think it's a robust relationship or if, uh, if that's relevant to your case. But we are not able to go through the robustness of the relationship in each of those, but we hope that it's a helpful, searchable, um, free online web or resource that you could use in clinic uh, to um, you know, see if this potential exposure is associated with HP. So the PICO question number two uh, for exposures, should patients with new ILD where HP is suspected undergo serum IgG antibody testing? Um, so again, the literature search identified 17 observational studies. They were all, they were all basically, they were all in farmer's lung or bird fancier's lung. Um, and when they were pooled, so some of the studies were pooled uh, in the meta-analysis that was published in a separate, um, a separate uh, systematic review and meta-analysis and annals of ATS for some of the PICO questions, um, found a pooled sensitivity of 83% and a pooled specificity of 68% to identify HP versus other ILDs. And those numbers don't sound too bad. But again, remember these are on from pretty small studies um, and from mostly fairly specific uh, types of HP. So the recommendation at the end of the day from the guideline is that for non-fibrotic and fibrotic HP, it's suggested, which means a weak recommendation, suggests performing serum IgG testing that targets potential antigens associated with HP. So there are some issues with this, with, with this recommendation. So we all know that a positive IgG indicates exposure and not necessarily disease causation. The assays are not standardized. So where I work, I can't order these. I have no access. We don't have this lab test here. Perhaps I should develop it based on local antigens, but I haven't got that far. I would have to send samples to either Toronto, like across, basically across a continent within my country, um, or to National Jewish in Denver, and I have no idea if the, the, uh, the antigens that they're using there are, are the same as the ones in my local environment. When, when you look at the data, um, there are variable cutoffs for positivity in these studies. So when we try to pool all these studies together, they use different cutoffs. Um, they use different assays and different cutoffs for what constitutes a positive um, IgG test. So it's really hard to, I think, pool these data together. The big question that I always wonder, and I think is unclear, is what is the additive discrimination? If I know that somebody has a feather duvet, that's pretty helpful. So I don't, it, it has yet to be borne out. What adds to that if I then do an IgG that is positive? And what do I do if it's negative? If it's negative, I'm going to ignore that because they tell me that they are sleeping with the duvet and I probably didn't identify another antigen. So I don't know. Um, I don't think it's clear what that adds to the overall diagnostic valuation. So this is the um, the diagnostic algorithm um, from the guideline. Essentially, you've got new ILD, you do an exposure assessment um, and a CT scan, plus a BAL, uh, plus or minus biopsies. If you have an exposure identified, and you have a typical CT and a lymphocytosis, patients should be reviewed in a multidisciplinary discussion. You can establish a high confidence diagnosis of HP. Every other combination of exposure, it's an unclear diagnosis. And then this takes you back, it suggests reconsidering the exposures. And of course, um, 
the group uh, organizing the conference here published a paper a few years ago where, you know, if you really interrogate patients, you know, every six months, year after year, you may have thought they had IPF, but eventually you might find in a proportion of those patients, maybe 40%, that they have an exposure. And if you re-review things, they might have HP. And that might be very important, especially early in disease, to change the outcome of their, uh, of their management and their prognosis. So this is the diagnostic algorithm. So I'm going to run through a few case examples here. So if, let's say a patient has a pet cockatiel, so they have exposure positive, and a pet parrot. They've got birds. They have a typical CT with mosaic attenuation and nodules. Even if you don't do a bronchoscopy, you can land at a moderate confidence diagnosis of HP. If you do a bronchoscopy on this algorithm and you have lymphocytosis greater than 30%, even if you don't do a biopsy, you can establish a high confidence diagnosis of HP. If you want it to be very definite, which may or may not be required, uh, you can go on to a biopsy. If you have no exposure identified, but a typical CT and a lymphocytosis greater than 40%, for example, you can still arrive at a moderate confidence diagnosis of HP if you don't have other um, considerations on the differential diagnosis. So, so this really can change in the same, same CT, same BAL. You go from high confidence to a lower degree of confidence because of the exposure lacking. An absent exposure, even if it's compatible with HP, even if you had a you know, fairly confident biopsy, um, you can only establish a moderate confidence diagnosis. If you have no exposure and the CT is indeterminate for HP, it's, it's never really excluded. But at this point, you would have to think, well, what do I have? What other considerations do I have in the differential diagnosis? Is there an autoimmune process? Is this smoking? Is this a, another exposure? Um, but it makes it much less likely. So there are limitations of this algorithm for sure. My biggest issue is it, with it is that it dichotomizes exposure into yes or no. Actually, my second biggest issue is that you can't make a definite diagnosis without a biopsy. Uh, and this was sort of a random threshold of greater than 30% for the lymphocytosis, but that was as good as we could do based on the evidence. So remember, these are not diagnostic criteria for clinical purposes, and they provide estimates of probability to guide your patient care. So we actually, at the same time, um, and along with Professor Morell and uh, Dr. Salisbury, um, have, we're working on this workshop. And I proposed this workshop because I really wanted to delve in further into the exposure assessment tools for HP. So this was being run complementary at the same time as the guideline. And we addressed these. These are basically the tools that we currently have available. History and exposure questionnaires. If you avoid the antigen and get better, is that diagnostic? What about an environmental assessment uh, with industrial hygienists and occupational clinicians, specific inhalational challenge, um, a serum specific IgGs, lymphocyte proliferation testing, skin testing, and then a multidisciplinary assessment. But because it's a workshop, um, we didn't and cannot provide um, recommendations like a guideline can for clinical care which is fair, but we reviewed the evidence that is available in a workshop setting. Um, we established, uh, we sort of did a bit of a vote, and I think this table summarizes everybody's, after having reviewed all the data, this table summarizes what we think is uh, imp an important takeaway. So our expert raters um, reported that a history, it performs quite well, very feasible, and it's, it's clinically useful. It's fundamental to the clinical assessment. There's no arguing that. Questionnaires, they perform well, they're pretty feasible, so, you know, either in paper or online form, but should be locally adapted and validated. Improvement with antigen avoidance may be informative in cases if it's non-fibrotic. So we all have, I'm sure we all have many patients with fibrotic HP where you've removed the antigen and the patient continues to get worse. Environmental assessment performs well. I don't have a group of industrial hygienists that I work with. I know that's not feasible here for me to do that. I don't go into people's homes. It's limited by the resources available. Specific inhalational challenges, challenge performs well, um, but it's not feasible in most centers. So it's not broadly available to many non-expert centers and requires experienced labs. A serum IgG, the test performance is actually not very good. So this corresponds to like FAIR. It's you know not very feasible and FAIR clinical utility. Um, skin testing isn't on there because nobody's really doing it anymore, even though in the past I know there was reasonable data that it may have been informative, but we didn't include it in this table. And that multidisciplinary assessment, so sitting down with industrial hygienists, occupational um, and exposure assessment experts, along with the clinicians, is probably a pretty good step, but warrants further evaluation. Um, I'm just going to uh, end off with, we developed this, I, I think, um, 
I promised I wasn't going to go overtime, but I'm just at the very last minute here. <laughs> so we developed this vegan, this nomogram. So I think um, there's a, there's a concept of it's not yes or no. There are exposures and there are probabilities of how valid those exposures are. So, for example, I would say the exposure starts your pretest probability of disease. So let's say you have no exposure. Maybe you're starting at a 50 percent pretest probability. If you have some mold in the home, but if you've done serum IgG that's negative, slightly higher pretest probability, the patient reports mold and they have a positive immunoglobulin, that's a higher pretest probability. And if they are breeding pigeons or they have a ton of birds, you're starting at a higher pretest probability. So for the same CT scan, the same findings on biopsy, it's going to take you through this likelihood ratio uh, through to the end uh, post-test probability of this diagnosis. I think we need to be thinking about our exposure assessment much more along a gradient um, of probability, maybe low, medium, high, as opposed to yes, no, because I don't think that applies in all aspects of, of uh, exposures. And of course, we know that the management of HP, it's important to find the antigen because you've got to remove the patient from the causative exposure. So, you know, so particularly studies in Japan uh, and then some older studies have shown that even if uh, patients think they've gotten rid of their bird, if you sample their dust, there's avian exposure in their home years later, and that's associated with worse outcomes over time. Um, the problem is it's hard for patients to clean their homes uh, extensively, especially with birds. If it gets into the ducts, it's, it can be challenging to know if it's been accomplished. And then if people have to move or change their jobs, that has significant impact on the patient. Um, this uh, study in lung transplant patients, I just wanted to highlight that eight, so this was at UCSF, 31 patients at HP, 91 had uh, IPF. HP patients actually did better than IPF patients over time. 16% um, of HP was found on the explant, so maybe didn't have an identified exposure, but the pathology was consistent, and then it recurred in two patients who were then subsequently re-exposed to birds. So that's, again, an important reason to, to identify the exposure. There's so much more to come in HP, um, even in the upcoming year. So the ACCP in the U.S. Um, has a clinical practice guideline that is under revised review, so should be published soon. A lot of work in the risk, in the area of antigen exposure and um, exposure questionnaires, and of course therapeutics. Um, and this is where I live in the summer. This is where I get my fresh air, and I suspect there's no antigens there, and where I like to spend some time. And hopefully, you can all come visit. And uh, thank you so that much. Was, that was fantastic, Dr. Johansson. Thank you very much. Uh, you were very punctual, uh, as you agreed. Uh, so uh, just uh, I would like to remind the audience, uh, os recuerdo que podéis hacer preguntas en el chat y dirigírselas directamente a la ponente. Nosotros aprovecharemos para leerlas. While the audience is thinking about the questions, uh, I will have uh, one for you. So, um, are you aware if there is uh, a worse prognosis depending, I mean, you made clear you, that uh, the prognosis is worse when we do not know or with uh, the incident antigen, but is there uh, any data or are you aware of being a worse prognosis depending uh, of the nature of the incident antigen? I mean, do we have a worse prognosis with um, fungi or with avian proteins? No, what, what do you think about it? Yeah, it's interesting. So in our, in our recently rejected paper, um, that was one of the comments. <laughs> and uh, the difficult thing is if you, if the literature is not yet there to support that. So, so you're trying to do a comp comprehensive literature search and extracting the data from all of the studies. Um, they don't break it down enough to be able to say that birds are associated with a worse prognosis. Um, so I don't think the data are there to to support that. I'd be interested to find out and, you know, people with more extensive um, clinical experience, if that's been the case. I, I suspect there's a combination of genetics as well. Um, so I think we know once we can get to it, if we can identify patients with short telomeres or uh, telomere related dysfunction, I think that's going to be um, you know, very prognostic. And then, of course, you know, uh, differentiating between acute and, and, and chronic. But I guess, you know, we know that acute patients get better. So the, with the, within the category of fibrotic lung disease, I'm not sure that we have the data to inform that. Thank you very much. Probably what, what happens uh, uh, is, is that uh, we, we, we make all the, all the diseases in the in, in, in same uh, place. And probably we, we, would, we would distinguish, no? 
uh, what is uh, the, the, the HP for fungus or a HP for, for birds. And I think it is different, probably because for this reason, it is diff very difficult to standardize uh, diagnostic tests because it are very different, very different diseases. What do you think about this? You can comment something with this? That um, are you asking that or saying that the approach to bird-related HP diagnosis would be different than the approach to to mold or fungus-related? Yes, like probably that are that are not 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 identical disease. Uh, they have differences, but because it is it is a disease that is not very frequent for us, every center is very difficult to to study uh, se separate separate no diseases. Absolutely. And I think we're this I think um, we've worked so hard in the field of IPF over the last 20 or 30 years. And now there's like a booming interest in what is HP and is it different than IPF uh, or is it, you know, there's some discussion that HP without an antigen could be an intrinsic uh, antigen that's triggering the, the disease potentially. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but I think we have the having the consensus diagnosis um and the criteria from the guideline uh, will be the first starting point and i think we have years of work to do and we'll be looking a lot at you know the data that you've published over time and i think putting that all into context with the new diagnostic consensus guideline will move us forward but there's so much to learn about this it's you know i had a case yesterday that um they had an exposure years ago and i don't know if I don't know how to treat this person now. I don't know. Do I watch and see if it gets worse over time? Do you know? Do we know that? Um, yeah, I don't know that we have, we have so many questions about um, the prognosis and best treatment and whether we should keep looking for another antigen that keeps you on your toes in clinic. That's for sure. Well, it seems clearly there's an urgent need for combining efforts regarding HP, and I think we will have. Uh, new interesting data coming uh, in the near future. So uh, that's all for now in this lecture. Thank you very much for joining us and for making the effort of uh, waking up so early. We, we, we hope that you are joining us in the future in, a, in, the, in our face-to-face -face meetings. Have Thank a good day. Thank you very much. You too. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. Pasamos ahora a la siguiente ponencia que vendrá de la mano del doctor Morey, eh, aquí a mi derecha. El doctor Morey no necesita presentación, él es el fundador del curso, ha sido jefe de servicio y fundador del servicio de neumología del Hospital Vallebrón, eh, promotor del primer trasplante pulmonar en España, ha dedicado su actividad clínica investigadora al estudio de las enfermedades intersticiales pulmonares, ha estado involucrado en, en, en numerosas guías internacionales eh, de diferentes enfermedades intersticiales y ahora nos hablará sobre la neumonitis por hipersensibilidad y se centrará en las guías diagnósticas ATS-ALAT eh, de la Sociedad Japonesa del 2020, lo sabido y lo nuevo. Muchas gracias, doctor Morey, cuando quieras, adelante. Uh, muchas gracias por la presentación, doctor Hanguren. Luego le invito a comer cuando acabemos este, ¿no? <ríe> este simposio. Y que buenos días a todos. Eh, encantado de que haya tanta gente que nos pueda estar eh, escuchando, desde los compañeros, amigos españoles, eh, franceses, argentinos, eh, colombianos, mexicanos, etcétera, etcétera. Y que es, es, es un, un halago para nosotros tener tanta gente que, 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 que crea que puede aprender algo con, con nosotros. ¿no? Y que hoy vamos a hablar un poco de, de las guías, de las últimas guías que como sabéis pues han, han salido eh, el de 1 de agosto de, 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 de este año, las guías, que son las primeras guías que se han hecho de neumonitis. Hacía año, años que se, se decía deberíamos hacer unas guías, deberíamos hacer unas guías, y como siempre tiene que haber un líder, y este líder es, es el Ganesh Ragu, es el que cogió el, 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 el mando de esto y, y ahí participamos un poco, un poco todos. ¿no? Uh, aquí tenéis un poco la, todo el panel de, de, los, de los que participamos en estos uh, dos años de trabajo intermitente y como veis hay tres, tres ponentes que hasta están, estamos hoy aquí, la doctora Kerry Johansson y Margaret uh, Salisbury. ¿no? Bueno, la definición que se escogió uh, de, de las discusiones es esta, que es más o menos la que todos utilizábamos, una enfermedad inflamatoria, 
aguda o crónica, ¿no? y entonces le, le llamamos inflamatoria o fibrótica, que afecta al tejido pulmonar, resultado de una reacción inmunológica mediada por un antígeno prácticamente siempre inhalado, algunos, algunos puede ser un, un antígeno oculto que no sabemos, y que tiene que producirse, tiene que darse en, en individuos genéticamente susceptibles. ¿no? Bueno, los síntomas ya, ya naturalmente no han variado de los que sabemos todos, la disnea, la, la tos, la fiebre o fiebrecilla. Quizás es interesante resaltar los chirping rails, que son estos, estos eh, sibilantes mesoinspiratorios, que no son muy frecuentes, pero cuando los escuchamos, que a lo mejor es en un 15-20% de los, de los casos, nos ayudan mucho. Al menos a mí me, me ayuda mucho a decir, mira, además tiene chirping rails. En cuanto a la, a las, a las, al, al, al escáner, los escáneres, bueno, aquí tenemos la forma, la, la forma no, no, no fibrótica, que sería esta, esta de la izquierda, ¿no? y donde, bueno, donde como sabemos, es la, la típica imagen en mosaico, zonas hiperclaras y zonas con vidrio esmerilado, muy típico, o a veces también la, la forma con mic, micronodular, suele ser mic, micronodular a veces eh, periférico, centro lobolillar, ¿no? La forma de en medio, todas esas son, 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 son tomografías de, de la publicación y es, es la forma esta que no sé, es difícil a todos decir si es una forma aguda o es una forma ya crónica, porque como vemos, el tejido pulmonar ya es de la parte de, de vidrios merilados está mucho más denso, ya casi, casi podríamos decir que inicia un retículo y las zonas claras estas nos indican claramente que seguramente es una neumonitis por hipersensibilidad. Y la de la derecha es una forma típica de, de fibrosis ya, ya avanzada con, con panal y que sobre todo afecta, como siempre se dice en las bases, porque había, hubo una discusión que si afectaba, porque siempre se decía que la neumonitis afectaba más en la parte superior de los pulmones. Nosotros ya hace tiempo que no era nuestra experiencia y, a, y ahora se, se ha aceptado que, que afecta más, más a, la, a las bases. Y este... Este, esta, este escáner podría ser un escáner naturalmente de cualquier eh, IPF, de cualquier eh, fibrosis pulmonar idiopática, como sabemos, es una de las formas en que puede presentarse la neumonitis por, por hipersensibilidad y, y creemos que hay muchas más de las que se aceptan. ¿no? Este la, la he puesto un poco porque es una forma característica que también es, es de la publicación y es un poco la, la forma esta que ya casi casi es patognomónica, que hay, hay tres fases, ¿no? Que es de pulmón prácticamente normal, si sale la flecha, sería por aquí, zonas de hiperlucencia y luego zo zo zonas de inflamación, de vidrio esmerilado de inflamación. Si se dan estos tres, estos, estas tres uh, cosas, pues, pues casi casi se puede decir que es, que es una neumonitis por hipersensibilidad segura, ¿no? En cuanto a la anatomía patológica, bueno, es, tampoco ha variado naturalmente de lo que, de lo que sabemos hasta, hasta ahora, ¿no? Quizá pues un poco los, 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 los granulomas con las células gigantes, estas dos, estas dos de aquí, las células gigantes que, que tienen incluso pues, eh, cristales de, de colesterol eh, dentro, o estas, o estas con las formas, esta de aquí, la C, con las formas con... con con moléculas de cuerpos de, de Chauman, ¿no? Y bueno, como vemos, son, son granulomas mal formados y muy diferentes de lo de la, de la, de la diapositiva de la figura D, que son, son eh, eh, granulomas sarcoidóticos y son, son súper bien formados y, y muy, muy, muy distintos de los que son de neumonitis, ¿no? ¿Cómo clasificamos la neumonitis? Hemos suprimido la forma subaguda, porque era, era, era difícil de, 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 de colocarla. Entonces, hoy día nos hemos quedado solo ya con la forma no fibrótica y la forma fibrótica, ¿no? ¿Cómo las clasificaremos, sobre todo? Sí, no sé si la diapositiva es... Ah, no, perdón, perdón. Eh, no. no sé si... No sé si, sí. no sé si lo, lo clasificamos por el, por el escáner y por la biopsia, ¿no? Y bueno, la, la forma fibrótica, como es lógico... Eh, es, tiene una supervivencia mucho menor y también es mucho menor si la capacidad vital está baja, con, si hay pocos linfocitos en el lavado broncoalveolar, si se, sigue expuesto el paciente al, al antígeno en cuestión, 
y o, sea, y, o si somos capaces de, no somos capaces de encontrar el antígeno. Todo, o sea, todo esto hace que la supervivencia sea peor. Incluso hay otras, que eso ya no son de las guías, sino que ya son de, de un estudio con el doctor Ohamuren, que si el paciente es mayor de edad o tiene una difusión baja o con, con, un, con un, un escáner, con un patrón de, de neumonía intestinal usual, lógicamente la supervivencia es, es será menor. ¿no? Bueno, ¿cuál es la epidemiología? Si uno mira la literatura, que es lo que hemos revisado digamos, durante, en estas guías, pues más o menos la, 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 la incidencia ¿eh? es de 0,3 a 0,9 por 100.000 habitantes. Pongamos en números redondos 1, 1 por 100.000 habitantes. ¿no? Nosotros hemos, en el estudio que se ha publicado este mes en, en archivos de bronconomología, pues vimos que la frecuencia, la incidencia, perdón, en el Valle de Bron es de 4,9% durante 10 años. Es decir, que cada año lo que vemos nosotros es 0,5 por 100.000, pero no, no, no total, solamente de, de pulmón del cuidador de aves ya vemos esta cifra. O sea, quizá nosotros los, los buscamos mucho y tenemos una cifra un poco más alta que la que se describe en la literatura, ¿no? Bueno, ¿cuáles son las causas? Y se describen aquí en las guías, ¿no? Pues son las de, naturalmente, las que, las que conocemos todos, ¿no? Las, lo, uno de los más frecuentes son las, las plumas, ¿no? Uh, lo que, los, los hongos, tanto las humedades de, de, la, de las paredes de algunas casas, o el corcho humedecido, o algunos almacenes con, con frutas que se han, se han podrido, o estos humidificadores caseros, que todos hemos visto algún, algunos casos, o el, o el típico spa, que aquí en, en, en nuestro país es, es poco frecuente, pero, pero por ejemplo en Estados Unidos es muy frecuente y se, se, se diagnostica, diagnostican muchos casos. ¿no? Uh, ahí está la, a la derecha los, las diferentes modalidades de, de causas de, de neumonitis y son las mismas que las que copiadas del año 2017 cuando publicamos nosotros uno, lo que se llaman las perspectivas en el diagnóstico, ¿no? Y, y la, las conté, y más o menos son se, se, unas 70 causas o, o diferentes exposiciones que podemos encontrar. Bueno, en cuanto a la patogenia, tampoco varía mucho. Aquí tenemos, la, la, el, 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 siempre es, una, es, es una, una alteración de la respuesta inmunológica. Y que, bueno, eh, por una parte está la, que hay un aumento de la, de la, de la antigenicidad de, los, de, de la IgG específica, los anticuerpos, que son luego los que nos servirán para detectar las, las llamadas precipitinas. Y también influye, también está en marcha, la inmunidad celular con los, con los, con los, eh, los linfocitos TH1, que eh, curiosamente ya nosotros hicimos un estudio el año 1982 y hace ya, son, son muchos años ya, eh, el, y la edad de nacimiento de, de nuestra patóloga, <ríe> la doctora Sansano, así que hemos coincidido después de muchísimos años, donde de, poníamos en un estudio donde se, se demostraba que había, estaba en marcha la, la inmunidad uh, celular y publicado en este, en el, en el Journal of Allergy y Clinical Immunology. ¿no? Bueno, al cabo de, de, un, de un tiempo se ponen en marcha los, los linfocitos TH2, que son los que luego fabricarán los fibroblastos y acabaremos en la forma fibrótica. Bueno, ¿cómo, cómo se diagnostica? Y si, sigo un poco o, o prácticamente todas las guías y si no, ya lo voy diciendo. ¿no? Bueno, el, la forma no fibrótica, yo creo que la forma no fibrótica es, es, es fácil de diagnosticar porque normalmente... Siempre sabemos dónde está el antígeno y si lo hacemos evitar, tenemos muchos menos problemas. Donde tenemos problemas todos es en la forma fibrótica, ¿no? Entonces, por, porque una de las cosas que ya seguramente ya ha mencionado ¿no? uh, la, 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 la doctora es que bueno, solamente encontramos las, las causas en, en un 50%. O sea, pues parece mentira, pero lo, las publicaciones refieren solamente alrededor del 50%. Lo, hemos dicho que bueno, los, los síntomas de la, de, de la tos, el ahogo, eh, la ocultación de los, de los chirping rails nos ayuda, el escáner, que ya no insistiremos, la función pulmonar, que casi siempre 
de un fenómeno restrictivo y después los, los anticuerpos, la, la búsqueda de anticuerpos pues, a, en frente de los antígenos más, 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 más frecuentes. ¿no? Nosotros los hacemos siempre y las guías, como veremos después, la, lo recomiendan, ¿no? aunque un, un, un poco... Un poco reticentes, pero lo que se recomienda es practicarlo. Nosotros, la verdad es que nos ayuda mucho porque lo hacemos en nuestro laboratorio y ya tenemos mucha experiencia de muchos años a la hora de interpretarlo. ¿no? La broncoscopia, las guías las recomienda, sobre todo para, para el lavado broncoalveolar con las cifras de, de linfocitos, donde ahí siempre se, se pide una cifra de linfocitos superior al 30%. Nosotros eh, eh, por los estudios que hemos hecho, creemos que a partir del 20% ya, ya es muy significativo a favor de neumonitis. Y luego la criobiopsia. La criobiopsia en, en las guías de momento no se recomienda y, y por ejemplo, nosotros la hacemos prácticamente rutinariamente. ¿no? Y, y en Europa creo que, es, que, que se hace así. El test de inhalación ¿no? de, 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 frente, a, frente a la causa, que bueno, nosotros con el doctor Muñoz, etcétera, Uh, lo, lo publicamos y yo creo que lo validamos incluso, pero no, no, siempre, no siempre se considera así. Y nos ayuda, a nosotros nos ayuda muchísimo, sobre todo a, a confirmar que la causa es aquella ¿no? y, y por lo tanto que el paciente está, está digamos, sensibilizado a aquella causa. Y yo digo que a nosotros nos ayuda y para nosotros es fácil. Yo incluso lo hemos practicado incluso a nivel, a nivel de la consulta privada. Es, decir, es, es, es un test que si uno quiere... Es, es fácil de realizar. Lo que pasa es que, bueno, a veces las cosas cu cuestan de ponerse en marcha, ¿no? Y finalmente, la, la, la biopsia pulmonar uh, uh, a cielo abierto, digamos, de las que es, es, es una recomendación muy típica de, de los Estados Unidos, uh, quizá porque como no hacen alguna de las pruebas anteriores, pues tienen que acabar en la biopsia. Yo, la verdad es que siempre intento uh, ponerme... Uh, en contra de la, practicarla, porque para no ser agresivos, para no ser invasivos, y si uno hace todas las demás pruebas, es, es casi casi excepcional tener que llegar a la biopsia, un manar hacia la biopsia. Pero bueno, eso no es lo que dicen las guías. ¿eh? Bueno, entonces, ¿qué, qué utilizamos? Los, 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 como ya ha dicho nuestra, nuestra Kerry, pues bueno, un poco, primero de todo, lo que nos sirve es conocer el, el antígeno. Y puede ser tener un escáner típico y tener uh, una biopsia. Ya, ya he dicho que nosotros la biopsia intentamos no, no hacerla nunca, si puede ser. Y así que hacemos la criobiopsia, pero no a cielo abierto. Y después tener una, una li, linfocitosis. Esto no nos ayuda mucho y creo que en eso estamos todos de acuerdo. Hoy día las guías en aquel, en aquel uh, panel que ha enseñado Kerry, pues estaría pues, el, el, el agente, el conocer la gente, un, un CT un TC típico y una cifra alta de linfocitos. La IgG específica nos ayudará en muchos casos, ¿no? Y luego, pues, es más frecuente la neumonitis, como sabemos, que sean mujeres y que sean pers personas eh, no fumadores. ¿no? Bueno, la, la, en cuanto a la anatomía patológica, como podéis suponer, no, no ha variado en absoluto, ¿no? Y, bueno, un poco el diagnóstico seguro, dice aquí confidente, pues, pues te, te es tener una, una, una neumonía, sí, inflamación, una bronquiolitis y la granuloma, que es la, la triada, ¿no? Inflamación, bronquiolitis y granuloma. Y si encontramos a veces eh, eh, macrófagos espumosos, las formas un poco más raras, nos ayuda, nos ayuda un poco a favor, ¿no? Entonces, si en vez de los tres solamente tenemos dos, el diagnóstico únicamente será probable, ¿no? Y si solamente, si solamente tenemos uno de, los, uno de los tres, entonces será el diagnóstico aún más difícil. Y bueno, si vemos que en la biopsia nos dice la patóloga que hay eh, metaplasia peribronquial, lo que antes se llamaba lambertosis, o, o una expansión que hoy día se llaman ellos de la fibrosis en los, en, en las, en los alveolos, en los septos alveolares, o hay o zonas de NOC, de neumonía organizada, pues bueno, un, un poco más en favor nos ayudará. ¿no? Uh, ¿Cuál es la histología, sobre todo, de la forma más la, fibro, la fibrótica? 
bueno, pues, lo, pues lógicamente lo que veremos en la fibrosis, sobre todo subpleural y a veces eh, centracinar con algunos puentes de, 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 entre, entre, uno, entre, un, entre unos, unas sustancias y otras. ¿no? Y aquí, en, esta, en, este, en, la, en la parte fibrótica, recordemos que muchos de ellos, de las formas fibróticas, evolucionan como neumonía intercepcial usual, de aquí la, la, de aquí la confusión y lo, de, lo que siempre vamos repitiendo, que muchas de las fibrosis fumar idiopáticas son, son, son neumonitis, que no, se, no hemos podido buscar bien el antígeno, el diagnóstico, o, o, o encontramos formas de, de NINE, neumonía intersecial no específica, o la metaplasia, esta famosa peribronquial que hemos dicho antes. Y a veces al encontrar, siempre le decimos a la doctora Sansano, no hay alguna célula eh, peribronquial, alguna célula gigante por ahí que si, siempre ayuda al diagnóstico y, 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 y tiene, tiene su valor. ¿no? Bueno, este cuadro ya lo ha pasado también, también eh, la, la, la doctora. Y bueno, un poco viene a decir esto, que si tenemos la, la, el paciente con en, contact, con en contacto, exposición, un bal con linfocitos y un, y un TAC característico, el diagnóstico está hecho, que es de aquí. Si nos falla alguno de ellos, y vamos, vamos un poco rápidamente porque ya, ya, ya lo hemos visto antes, pues entonces no nos queda más, re, más remedio que intentar o criobiopsia o biopsia hacia el abierto. Pero como digo, en, en nuestra... En nuestro centro, al menos, eh, pocas veces hemos de recurrir a la biopsia hacia el abierto. Con la criobiopsia y todas las demás pruebas tenemos suficiente para, para el diagnóstico, un diagnóstico correcto. Y esta, este cuadro que también ha, 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 ha enseñado, la verdad es que es un cuadro que para, para explicar es, es infumable. ¿no? <ríe> un poco así nos, nos basamos sobre todo en, en el escáner, nos basamos en, en la exposición y nos basamos en, el, en, los, en los linfocitos en el VAL. Y entonces, bueno, esto es un, es un damero maldito donde sirve para orientación y cuando uno tiene un caso, eso, podemos ir a la tabla y ver eh, dónde caería. Como podéis entender, es, es muy poco seguro, como quien bien ha dicho Kerry Johansson, es muy poco seguro porque, bueno, incluso en las discusiones eh, decíamos que un poco más a la izquierda, esto un poco más a la derecha, o sea, es muy difícil estandarizar un, un diagnóstico con, con un cuadro de este tipo, pero bueno, sí, sirve al menos como orientación. Bueno, y finalmente, ¿qué recomendaciones hicimos? Yo creo que ya Kerry ya, ya las ha dicho, pero bueno, muy, 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 muy en resumen, o sea, podemos decir que, 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 que recomendamos de los cuestionarios. Se revisaron muchísimos artículos, 32, y no hubo una recomendación del comité porque no hay ningún cuestionario que sea, que sea eh, FETEN, ¿no? para hacer ser característico. O sea, hay muchos que utilizan, desde luego de, de, de se recomienda hacer un cuestionario, nosotros tenemos un cuestionario estándar, que son dos hojas, muy, muy, muy sencillo, que si, si alguno quiere lo podemos mandar, pero no hay ninguno recomendado para, por, por las guías. ¿no? En cuanto a las, a las IgG, los IgG específicas, se revisaron pues, 49 artículos y bueno, se, se vio que lo de siempre, ¿no? que es muy, muy sensibles y poco específicos. Y el, el, pero de todas maneras el comité eh, sí, sí, que, sí, sí que sugiere hacerlos. ¿no? Eh, nosotros ahora eh, hemos, hemos enviado y nos han aceptado en archivos de bronconeumología un estudio con, con los colegas de Besanzón, donde presentamos un nuevo tipo de... De, 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 de detección de antígenos que son, que son por antígenos recombinantes. ¿no? Y la verdad es que tenemos una, una sensibilidad y especificidad eh, mejor. En cuanto al VAL, al lavado bronco ¿no? pues se sugiere que sí, que se haga hoy día, la, 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 digamos, las guías. Nosotros hace muchísimos años y, como digo, siempre, siempre nosotros a partir del 20% consideramos ya ya muy significativo, mientras que los, los, las, los que formamos parte de todas las vidas eh, se, se, requir, se requirió un más de un 30%. La transbronqueada hoy día prácticamente no se recomienda, sobre todo en la forma fibrótica, y la criobiopsia en la forma no fibrótica no, no, no hubo ni una recomendación a favor ni en contra, y la forma fibrótica sí que se sugiere hacerla, ¿no? hacer la biopsia, la criobiopsia. 
Y bueno, y en cuanto a la, a, la, a, la, a, la, a la cirugía, a la biopsia por cirugía, pues bueno, se revisaron también muchísimos artículos referentes a esto y se sugiere ¿no? uh, que sí, que se debe realizar una vez se ha descartado y se ha hecho todas las otras pruebas para intentar evi evitarlo. ¿no? Y bueno, esto es un poco todo lo que queríamos uh, comentar. Uh, si alguno de los que están fuera viene alguna vez a, a Barcelona, Barcelona es una ciudad estupenda, al lado del mar, con un clima fabuloso y con una arquitectura muy, muy, muy bonita eh, que vale la pena, yo creo, que, que ver. Y ya que tenemos eh, eh, pues, eh, gente que nos está escuchando de Estados Unidos y de fuera, les voy a decir un poco, les voy a dar un, un vídeo de, de Pau Casals, cuando y, y lo, lo invitaron en la ONU, donde habla un poco de, de Cataluña. Y le servirá un poco de orientación. Si me quiere pasarlo. But let me say one thing. I am a Catalan. Today, a province of Spain. But what has been Catalonia? Catalonia has been the greatest nation in the world. I tell you, I will tell you why. Catalonia has had the first parliament much before England. Catalonia had the beginning of the United Nations. All the authorities of Catalonia in the 11th century met in a city of France, at that time Catalonia, to speak about peace at the 11th century. Peace in the world and against, against, against wars, the humanity of wars, this was Catalonia. Now, I am so, so happy, so happy, so moved to be here with you, dear and bueno, pues eso es todo. Muchísimas gracias por vuestra atención. ¿eh? Muy bien, muchas gracias, Ana. Bueno, quizá un poco lo que, lo que cuando me han dicho que tenía que clausurar el curso, pues he, he apuntado unas cuantas cosas a ver qué decir, ¿no? Y, en primer lugar, me, me recuerda muchísimo la, este curso lo que siempre decía el doctor Mario Saldaña, que era un, un peruano que estuvo en las escuelas primitivas de, la, de las enfermedades intersticiales y siempre decía cuando venía aquí, que vino tres o cuatro años, ¡qué casos más difíciles! ¿no? <risa> Porque la verdad es que los casos que presentamos es, es, son, son realmente difíciles de diagnosticar. Y creo que es un buen ejercicio el presentar estos casos para que todos hagamos un, un ejercicio de humildad. Qué difícil es, eh, aunque te den el TAC, etcétera, y todas las pruebas, qué difícil es adivinar el, el, el diagnóstico. ¿no? O sea, que se, seamos humildes, como siempre, porque la, las intersticiales, como, como muchas partes de medicina, Realmente son, son, son muy difíciles, ¿no? Y otra cosa que, que he pensado resaltar es que aquella típica, aquella típica máxima que dice que, que si quieres ir rápido, ves solo. Si quieres llegar lejos, ves en, ves en equipo, ¿no? Y esto es una, yo creo, este curso es una demostración de que, bueno, que estamos todos aquí intentando trabajar y mejorar, mejorar entre todos en equipo. Y creo que esto es una, 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 una cuestión fundamental de, de este curso que hemos logrado que todos participemos y sea, y sea un curso prácticamente de todos nosotros. ¿no? En fin, gracias a los asistentes en especial, ¿no? 
algunos de los que están más lejos, desde Hispanoamérica, Portugal, Francia. He visto ahora que, que la doctora Pinazo, que, que es una ex residente nuestra de hace veintipico de años, ¿no? eh, también debe ser la, una de las, de las que están en Francia. Eh, gracias a los, a, los, a los ponentes, realmente ha sido fantástico. Yo creo que todas las, las ponencias y las, y las discusiones han sido para mí excelentes. Gracias a los actuales neumólogos de, de nuestra plantilla del Vallebrón por seguir con la, con la antorcha encendida. ¿no? Y si, si me permitís un poco de filosofía, cuando uno va haciendo años, ¿no? piensas un poco más. ¿no? Uh, yo creo que, que en esta vida quizá lo, una, una de las cosas que yo creo que es relevante o quizá la, más re, o la única relevante es, es más que pensar en la salvación propia y en el futuro, es contribuir a mejorar lo, lo que hay en esta tierra. ¿no? Un poco como todos hemos ido mejorando gracias a, los, a nuestros antecesores, porque si no seguramente estaríamos en las cavernas o nos comerían las alimañas o, o moriríamos de, de microbios si no hubiera habido investigación y, y, y progreso. ¿no? En nuestro caso está claro que nuestro progreso es la mejora, contribuir a la mejora de la salud. ¿no? O sea que estoy encantado de, de ver la exitosa continuidad del, del, del curso. Como digo, es un curso y podemos decir que es, que, es, que es de todos. Y antes de acabar me gustaría tener un, un recuerdo por el doctor Chauvé. Seguramente él di, di, hubiera disfrutado de poder seguir también este curso con su, con su ánimo, con su entusiasmo. ¿no? Así pues, gracias por seguir trabajando en Bien de la Salud. Y hasta el año próximo, no sé si presencialmente o, o, o mixto. ¿no? Muchísimas gracias. ¿eh? Gracias.